Hey everybody, Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of the Break It Down Show. Recording my intro today from the backyard. It's sunny outside. There are jets flying, airplanes buzzing, helicopters whirring, and birds chirping, garbage trucks driving. All while I record this on my Bulletproof podcast rig, a Zoom H6 recorder, and Shure SM35 microphone. This is the Bulletproof podcast rig, and it is so because it's portable it's not too sensitive, yet yeah, sounds fantastic. Not paid to say that. That's just my quality recommendation on how to get a podcast going. All right, beyond that, today's guest, Boris Havel, is a Ph.D. professor from the University of Zagreb. He joins Dr. Timothy Furnish, who also is a Ph.D., both of them who are, have a deep knowledge of Islam, the Middle East, the Orient in general. And we're going to have a conversation about how we deal with places like Iran, how we deal with Islam and its role in America, how do we also deal with Christianity and all of these different things as they come together and make this sort of a crazy fabric. What do we do? What makes sense? And have an actual rational, sane conversation. Both of these guys who study Islam at the highest level and are passionate about it have been called Islamophobes. We're going to get past that. We're going to understand truly what, what, what's important about Islam. Instead of calling people names, let's hear the experts talk. Let's go forward and let's learn a little something. Hey, here's how you can support the show. Share the show. Tell your friends about the show. Buy the shirts. Anything. Talk to me about what you want to see. I'd love to hear what you want from guests. Too many veterans, not enough veterans. More women, less women. Whatever it's going to be, let me know. And definitely know that we're all out there working on this together, trying to tell these great stories. Uh, the last thing, and, and you know what I'm going to say next, Save the Brave. Hopefully you all are at least clicking on savethebrave.org. That's all I'm going to ask for today. All right, here comes Boris Abel. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan Heath. This East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, I'm Boris Havel. I'm a lecturer at the University of Zagreb, and you are listening to Break It Down Show. Yes, the Break It Down show is international, as you all know, and we love the Balkans. I was at a recent conference celebrating 70, uh, 70 years of NATO, and Boris and I were on the same panel. We were talking about Islam, and that's actually what Dr. Rich Lede and I were presenting our uh, upcoming paper on, on understanding that while we may have the separation of church and state, when we go to a state like the government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan or to Iraq, where on the flag it says the words Allah Akbar, we, we should ought to understand and consider how important religion is, not only in our country, really, but also in those places where, it, where it's, it's a center thing. So if we're going to talk about religion, going to talk about Islam, we have to bring in Dr. Tim Furnish. So because one, he's a historian, his story, his study of history uh, focuses on uh, Islam and eschatology. And also he was an Arabic linguist. So you've got one of the world's foremost experts on Islam and religion and how it impacts our foreign policy. And then and you have Boris, who's equally skilled. So I'm going to be quiet for most of the part and let Tim do a lot of the question asking because these two guys are among the heaviest hitters in the world in this field. And I know it's going to be fascinating. Hey, Tim, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Pete. I'm, I'll try to do my best, although we're not discussing albums today. Yes. Uh, I'll do the best I can. Well, Pete, I th maybe we should start out with, with something that we were talking about, Boris and I, a moment ago before we came on air. And Boris made the very interesting statement with which I uh, totally agree, but I wanted to go ahead and let him flesh it out, which is the idea, I believe, Boris, you said something along the lines of policymakers really need to understand, um, and, and if I'm paraphrasing it wrong, correct me, uh, religion in general, but but, but in particular, considering the, what's going on in the world, they need to understand Islamic history, but they tend to not want to do that. So can you, can you take it from there for a bit? Yes, sure, I can do that. Well, I live in Europe, and uh, Europe is uh, very heavily opinionated when it comes to ideologies and religions. And when they discuss uh, phenomena such as Islamic State uh, here in Croatia, but also in other European countries, they almost always use also the term so-called Islamic State, mm -hmm. uh, thus implying that it's not really Islamic and it's not really a state, but basically that it's not 
Islamic. And so uh, recently I wrote an article in Croatian language. And by the way, Croatia is not in the Balkans. We are Mediterranean. Oh, country. my apologies. Yeah, yeah. Balkans, that, that's east and the south of us. Okay, fair so, enough. Anyway, uh, I, I wrote an article about, uh, about uh, uh, explaining why Islamic State is not so cold, uh, but it uh, really does follow early Islamic beliefs, practices, uh, and historical narrative about the early caliphate, the Ar Rashidun. That article was not really very much understood. Why? Because most, even scholars of Middle East in Croatia and in Europe, do not know early Islamic history. Why? They've never studied it because there is no place to study it. I studied it in Israel. Why there is no place to study it? Well, generally, because of Edward Said and his uh, pamphlet Orientalist, in which he proclaimed the whole discipline illegitimate, uh, Europe followed the suits, laid down uh, great, uh, uh, great schools of Oriental studies that, that we had in 19th and early 20th century. So basically, it's very hard today in Europe to, to get to know what early, and, and it's a fascinating field, what early Islamic history, teaching, theology really is. Now, when modern Middle Eastern actors such as, let's say, Hamas or Islamic State refer to those early Islamic texts and uh, make them relevant for modernity, you have very few, even scholars, who understand what they are talking about when it comes to politicians, journalists, and um, uh, diplomats. They basically have no slightest clue. And that's a problem. And I would add to that, Boris, that that many of them don't want to have a clue. I, I was at a conference a couple of years ago. Pete, you'll find this interesting. Uh, it was in the D.C. area, Arlington. Of course, everything has to be in Arlington, right? Yeah. And it was put together by a think tank. And there were, you know, State Department people there and three-letter agency people there. And we were discussing things having to do with Iraq and Afghanistan. And um, we got into a discussion sort of just like Boris was talking about. And I and I was pointing out, well, well wait a minute. This, this stuff comes from early Islamic history and this stuff's from the Quran. You can't just dismiss it. Finally, and, and then there was a State Department fellow next to me that kept arguing with everything I said. And finally, I said to him, have you ever actually read the Quran? And his response was, I don't need to. Oh, boy. Oh, man. So, uh, yes, exactly. And I think that goes exactly what Boris is saying. I mean, it, it's on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, the intelligentsia or the self-proclaimed intelligentsia of, of, of Western civilization, most of them, there are a few exceptions, but most of them seem to have bought into this idea that, that if you point out that the uh, – if you take our enemies at face value, ISIS, the Islamic Republic of Iran, <laughs> groups like that, take them at face value and actually give credence to what they're saying motivates them, that's somehow discriminatory or that's somehow um, – that's somehow, the, the, you know, of course, Islamophobic. And I, I never understood – I mean it, w w when you know the Nazis were espousing Nazi ideology – um, no one went around saying, well, we can't talk about Nazi ideology because it will make the Germans look bad. Or when the Soviets, <laughs> when the Soviet Union still existed and, um, you know, the common turn was using Marxist Leninist ideas to try to overthrow and undermine governments around the world. Uh, we, we didn't go, oh, we can't discuss that because that might upset the Russians. But yet we have this idea now that is embedded, as Boris points out, embedded in, in, in the minds of most of academia and far too many policymakers, that that, that's ex that you can't unpack Islam and look at Islamic history and say, wait a minute, this idea of jihad, hmm, maybe that's not radical. Maybe it's not something that popped up in the 20th century when most of the people that write for the New York Times were born in the late 20th century. Maybe that has been around a little bit before that. So, and I will add, by the way, since I brought it up, that, that I, and Pete knows this about me, it drives people nuts, but I still think it's a point worth making. I really have a great deal of trouble with, in fact, I bridle at the usage of the terms like radical and extremist. Because as I point out repeatedly, both in terms of Quran uh, and Hadith's alleged sayings of Muhammad, Islamic history, and modern beliefs of many Muslims, 
waging jihad is not radical. Waging jihad is mainstream in Islamic history. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 people in the West use the term radical as or extremist, I think, as a synonym for militant or, or violent. But there are reasons that there are different words for those names. But anyway, to get back, I, Boris, I think, is, is exactly on to what's going on. And um, I, I'm just interested that you've managed to publish that and, and actually have a have a position in the university still, Boris. Well, let me jump in and ask a question to you guys, because we do get caught up in these words that actually have meaning, but we never slow down to actually consider, you know, um, transphobia and Islamophobia. Is it possible for either of you to be Islamophobes? Like, it's, to me, on the surface, that seems to be preposterous because how can you have an irrational fear of something that you're obviously passionate enough about to go study and in a field that's not exactly computer science where you know like, oh, I'm going to be cutting edge and have a chance to make a lot of money. Like you guys are studying something that is is hard to study and produce information that gets out of your of your specific silo. Is it possible for you guys to even be Islamophobes? Well, Pete, uh, please let me just before before that. That's a great question. Excellent question. Before we get to that, let me just uh, 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 follow up on what Tim said Please. when he compared when he compared attitude to Nazism and communism because it's very important and I'm I'm very happy that he he brought it up. Namely, whenever in history we had an organized mass movement of people, there was a theory behind it. And as social scientists, we know that there is no movement without a theory behind it. So when we talk about communism, it was a, a theory of communism, of course. All, all these movements, whatever you call them, I mean, the, the French Revolution, the, the American Revolution, they were all moved, prompted by some sort of theory. And it was common knowledge to social scientists that studying a theory to understand a movement is essential. Now, for, perhaps for the first time in history ever, we have an organized movement and so many, if not most, social scientists approach it as if there is no theory behind it. Mm. And I'm talking about jihadism now, uh, which is extremely amazing to me because it puts down the, the basics of scholarship to... to well, to do whatever else, uh, uh, you know, to, to be politically correct, to be nice to Islam, to be nice to to to, to the dean of the university or whatever. Uh, but this is something that is unprecedented in scholarly history uh, in 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 uh, in the last uh, five hundred years, I believe. Tim, please correct me if, if you think I'm wrong. I'm no, no, that, that's that's a very. I never heard it put that way, Boris. But that's exactly right. And I would add with that that I think it's it's tied up with. It's been tied up with, and as you point out, the 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 genesis of the of the ignorant thinking on this was created by Edward Said. And for, just quickly for people that don't know, basically the two poles of authority, if you will, <laughs> in modern scholarship on the Middle East and Islam in particular are Ebert Said and Bernard Lewis, Bernard Lewis, uh, Dr. Lewis, who died not long ago. Uh, Bernard Lewis was old school and was, was, was tarred by Said as an Orientalist. That is to say, Bernard Lewis was convinced, as those of us, a number of us in the field are, but we're a minority, I think, that to understand another culture, you have to really be able to know at least one of that culture's languages. I mean, you, it's really hard to be an expert on Russian history if you don't know Russian. It's really hard to be an expert on Chinese history if you don't know Mandarin. And so in this case, Bernard Lewis always said that since he was an expert in this, of course, this was easy for him. Uh, you, you need to know Arabic or Persian or Turkish. Uh, and, you know, he knew all three, of course, um, in order to understand Islamic civilization. You have to be able to read the texts in their original languages. And this is one thing that often differentiates, differentiates us, uh, those of us that are historians, uh, from political scientists, because political scientists generally don't tend to have that same sort of uh, belief. But anyway, Edward Said came along with this book, what, 78, right? Orientalism came out in 1978. And it is not an exaggeration to say that it's a Bible for the people on the left when it comes to area studies. And basically, Edward Said accused Edward, uh, excuse me, accused Lewis and other 
Western scholars, English, French, German, American, Croatian, who study in particular the Middle East and, and, and know the languages, uh, at least one of the languages. What was his term, Boris? Appropriating Islamic culture or something. I don't know how you appropriate a culture. That seems really strange to me. Yeah. But the, basically his, his argument, which has so many holes in it, it's ridiculous, more holes than, you know, the uh, Democrats impeachment articles. Basically, the Basically, the idea was that um, Western scholars only learned about the Middle East and learned languages so they could help with colonialism. Although, you know, Catholic, for instance, in particular, Catholic scholarship about Islam goes back into the Middle Ages, right, Boris? It, it long predates colonialism. So anyway, those are the two poles of authorities. And basically, the Saidians are the, of the opinion that um, anything, anytime the West Anybody in the West studies the Middle East or the Islamic world, it's with nefarious motives. And this is, and I think this, and sorry for that long disquisition, but I think that informs a lot of what's going on, particularly on the left. Those sorts of ideas have become an article of faith. Keyed into that too has become the idea of race. The left has successfully inculcated in the popular culture. I run into this all the time. It drives me crazy. Boris, I'm sure you do too. Pete, you see it. Mm. That, that Islam is a race and, and and somehow a dark-skinned race although you know i've been to iran and i've been to turkey and those people are whiter than i am which is saying <laughs> yes you know yeah they're yes. quite white. Yes. I mean, they're they're aryans you know just ask the iranians they'll tell you what they are a lot of that has been and of course the, you know these people also ignore the fact that there's you know about 400 million african christians who you know tend to be a bit dark, shall we say. But anyway, it's just become ridiculous. This idea that a religion, that, a, that an ideology, that a belief system is coterminous with a race. And then therefore, and, and to go back to what Boris was talking about, therefore, they conflate that. So if you, if, you, if you point out that jihad was waged by Muhammad, the founder of Islam, which is a historical reality, there's no argument about that, mm -hmm. um, that somehow you can then be dismissed as racist. And therefore, your argument is then deemed uh, deemed out of bounds. And this has infected policymakers. It was exactly. certainly in the, in the Obama administration. I, I, I used to, Pete, you know this, I used to regularly lecture at Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, which Boris is, is a, is a, is a uh, down here in South Georgia, I live near Atlanta, uh, and it's, a, it's the main training facility for Homeland Security people in the United States. And, and after a couple of years, election, a year or two after Obama was elected, and again, I was a regular lecturer down there on, on the counterterrorism issues having to do with uh, Islamic uh, jihad and that sort of thing. And I was informed that I would not be employed anymore because the, the, the edict had come down from on high, meaning from someone in the Obama administration, that any counterterrorism lecturer who discussed the concept of jihad was therefore w w w was not going to be employed anymore. So basically, yeah, to go back again, Boris, to what you said, it, we, you're you're not even supposed to talk about jihad, although our enemies talk about it constantly, and they proclaim all the time that's what they're waging against us, and that's what's motivating them. But we aren't supposed to discuss it. Well, look, we, you can talk about it. You can you can talk about it. Uh, well, for example, in Croatia, you can talk about it, and I, I can tell you a little bit more why is that so. You know, you might want to know this interesting piece of information. Uh, Said's book, Orientalism has been translated into Croatian language by the Soros Society, funded... Uh, why why am I not surprised? <laughs> exactly, and published. But uh, you, when, you, you know, when, you, when you speak to an ordinary Croat and you say Soros, uh, most people uh, know him, loathe him, you know, and don't, follow, don't want to go down that path. But you see how much it is an ideological and not a scholarly issue. So basically, what they have created when it comes to studying of Islam, jihad, and especially, as you mentioned, early Islamic history, because this is, that's what's really important. It's not really important who's killing whom at this moment in Baghdad. It is important how many people and why early Muslims killed, including the Muslim prophet Muhammad. Uh, now, when it comes to modern scholarship about uh, Islam, Unlike, of course, scholarship about Christianity, Judaism, or any other faith, what is important is not to have a correct methodology, but a correct ideology. And that really brings us back into what some people call the dark age, when religion determined what, scholar, what allowed 
and the uh, legitimate scholarship is and isn't. To be back into that age now in 21st centuries is outrageous. And I am really surprised that more scholars are not raising their voice. Yeah, I mean, we, we virtually have an index now but it's not being done by the church. It's being done by groups like Amazon. I mean, I wrote an article back earlier in the spring last year for an online conservative Christian publication called The Stream. And the first article I wrote for them was a review of a Tommy, that Tommy Robinson book about Islam. Now, I'm not a big fan of Tommy Robinson. Okay, I'll tell you that right now. But I mean, I read the book, which he co-wrote with another guy. And basically, the book doesn't say anything about Islam that's not true. And, and it has, and in fact, about half the book consists of um, consists of a, an English language translation of the Quran, which highlights the violent passages in the Quran. I mean, Tommy Robinson didn't write that, but yet that book was eventually banned from sale on Amazon, and after which Barnes and Noble and another large seller in the United States called, which you may not know, Boris called Books a Million. You may know, um, all th all of them followed suit after Amazon. So that book is almost impossible to get now. Why? Just because of what you just said, Boris. Yeah. Well, we have a book, um, you know, uh, Ibn Ishaq's uh, Sirat Rasul Allah, which is yes. uh, the, the earliest chronological biography of Muslim prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting chronological. Uh, that's the only early Islamic text, which is chronological narrative. Really fun to read. Uh, partially answers your question, Pete. Uh, I am not... Uh, Islamophobe. I enjoy reading. Uh, I mean, Islam is a great and interesting civilization, and I really enjoyed studying about it, reading about it. And of course, not all there is about Islam is jihad, uh, but jihad is one of the foundations of it. Now, this book has been translated by the chief, uh, by the head of the Muslim community of uh, Croatia and Slovenia. Uh, so uh, not exactly translated, but let's say paraphrased, retold. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been published in the year 2002 in the Croatian language here in Zagreb uh, under a similar title uh, called Prophet and His Men in, in Croatian language. Now, uh, if you can you know, believe it, that book has never been presented to a wider auditorium here in Croatia. Almost nobody knows about that book. You cannot find it to buy it anyway, anywhere, saved in the mosque of Zagreb, but it's hidden. It, it's under the desk. So you have to specifically come and ask for that book. And if they do not find you suspect, then you can get it. And it's, it costs just about 25 uh, US dollars. Uh, I also searched the internet just recently to show it to my students. You cannot, that's a book published in 2002 by the head of Islamic community here that's been had for more than 30 years. I mean, he's a very, very respected man, uh, and I know him personally. You cannot find that book's cover on the internet, and there is not one library which sells it here in Croatia. Now, mind you, that book is not Islamophobic. This book is written by the chief Islamic authority in this country. Wow. So they are trying to, uh, well, what I assume is they do not want the general public to know about these early texts. Uh, that's why I say to my students, you know, if you are a student, the first thing you should have in mind after, you know, keeping in mind the importance of, of, of methodology, is curiosity. So, I mean, if for no other reason, but for that reason that the book has been hidden for, for so many years, try to find it and read it. And I think I have motivated some people to, to start asking questions about it. So, it's not, so, so again, that's a book written by the chief Islamic authority. I mean, he's completely halal. He's, he's recognized by all Muslims here, even though I must also add that, that Croatian Muslims are by no means interested in jihad, and they are very, very secular, liberal, you know, they pork, and it's, yeah. it's completely... Uh, you they know, drink. It's, it's, I, I know, yeah, I know it's, those it's, people. I've been with yeah, them. Yeah, They're great. Yeah. But then I, then I ask, so, so for whom did he write this book? For which... For for we for for which reader, if it's 
to introduce early Islamic history to general public? Why did they not present this book to general public? Why to hide this book? So there is something about uh, this book and generally about Ibn Ishaq's uh, narrative that is uh, that is worth worth pursuing. Phyllis, I, I want to ask a, a question, and, and thanks for answering the uh, answering the Islamophobia question because, yeah, the, the whole point of that is it's like, of course you're not Islamophobes, you're you're Islamophiles. If anything, you know, we are just fascinated by that culture, and uh, we're going to have Timothy Macintosh Smith on the show in uh, gosh two weeks. And he and John uh, McKay and I are going to talk about his wonderful book, The 3,000-Year History of the Arabs. Turns out Arabs have been around for a long time. What's the – let's take out of con- – let's try to find a compare and contrast for this uh, d- the disdain, the rejection of understanding what the heck we're trying to do when it comes to Islam. What would that be akin to, uh, Tim or, or Boris? I mean, we can use Catholicism. We can use something non-religious. But it just – it shocks me how much – like Tim, when you've told me that story in the past about the State Department – we had uh, Ambassador Robert Hunter on the show. Boris, you met him at, at the uh, at the con- conference that we went to, and he talks about just the willful ignorance, you know, to hire the wrong people, to not go ask the people that know that, that the fact that you guys aren't helping advise, or that the, the preeminent person from a country in this field is is ignored or disregarded, or you can't read his book that's not even twenty years old. It's just. It's shocking to me that we presume to know anything about Islam as a as a nation or as a group of nations in terms of NATO or any of that stuff. So, sorry, I had to vent a little bit, but it's just so damned frustrating to have such a complex thing. You wouldn't dare do that if it was if you were going to go uh, try to try to work with people who are NFL fans, and you wouldn't you wouldn't even know the, the the players on the teams, let alone the teams. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. You wouldn't even know the, the, the players on the teams, let alone the teams. I don't know. My, both my kids play football, Pete, or in high school football. Yes. That one of my sons is probably going to wind up playing in college. So I, I've learned a lot more about football in recent years than I ever knew in my life. And so, yeah, I, that's an interesting. And that's since you brought that up, I think it would be like saying, <clears throat> all right, well, we're playing this team this week. And we know that they um, uh, they blitz a lot. And we know that when they blitz, that they like to, uh, and, and then and then some of their guys like to chop block, so which is illegal block sports. Blow the knee. It's, we're, we're talking American football, by the way, just so you know, mm, yeah, um, the, the good kind. Um, <laughs> and and it would be like saying, okay, well, we're going to watch this film, but we're not going to we're, we're going to we're not going to look at this part where these guys do the chop blocks or where they blitz and yeah. they. Uh, you know, maybe grab a face mask or something because we think it makes them look bad. And I'm like, what? <laughs> That's exactly what you want to prepare for. What's your example, Boris? Like, wh- how, how would you, what's the compare and contrast for how we treat Islam and scholarly learning, in, you know, when we're trying to do international policy? Okay, well, first, I should tell you that I know very well what football is because uh, when it comes to world championship croatia was second in russia last year that's right finals and, uh, against french and the, and the ju- most and americans the referee- most americans of course except for those colluding with putin were, were rooting for croatia i can tell you that uh, <laughs> yes yes thank you i know i know that now uh, to answer your question uh i think uh, there is a big problem uh in um, approaching modern islamic threats with the knowledge and the positive knowledge and experience of former threats to the West. That's what I'm uh, writing this uh, article to this university and the conference that, 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 that we that you referred to earlier. Uh, namely, when you were facing the threat of communism and earlier of Nazism, you did not have to study their theory. You had to study their tactics of war and their, their strategies. Now, Islam is different. 
uh, because uh, if you want to face the threat of Islam, you have to know their, the, the theory that lies behind that threat. And if you focus on the war tactics, it can actually get you off the track. Just, just imagine when, 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 uh, when the, the, the Western world, the pre-world, was fighting against that evil, which is Nazism. Uh, the, the theory was Nazism and their war tactics was Blitzkrieg, right? Now, just imagine if the Allies would say, we are at war with Blitzkriegism. <laughs> I mean, but that's exactly what, 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 what Westerners do when they say we are at war with terror. No, terror is a tactics of war, which is... That's a great point. Which man. is... And, and there is there is completely other theory which is behind it, and uh, and just because many of of the distinguished politicians and and uh, uh, military even uh, they 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 won this great victory against communism, they just somehow assume that Islamic threat is somehow similar, and so they continue to pursue tactics the methods of achieving goals, yeah. even goals, but never asking the question, what's motivating these people? Mm. Why is it so powerful? Because it can convert people who are Americans, Christians, Jewish, Buddhist, but that was not really the case with, with, with the communism, for example. So, so uh, uh, I believe that political scientists, politicians, but primarily scholars, need to detach their themselves from from all earlier experiences and and focus on uh, islamic threats as if starting from zero when it comes to analysis of international relations and security issues because it's so profoundly different pete let, let boris thank you well said let me add to that pete while i'm thinking Please. of it i think that I'm glad that he brought that up, and, and, I, and of course I brought up the comparison to Nazism and communism earlier, but it can be pushed too far. Um, the big difference, of course, is that Islam is a religion. It's not just an ideology. I can tell you how many times I've argued with conservatives on my side of the fence, Islam is not a religion. It sure as hell is. What are you talking about? It's not a religion. Is it a political religion? Yes. Is it far too often violent religion? Yes. But that's not all it is. It's certainly a religion. It's therefore profoundly qualitatively different from Nazism and communism. Nazism and communism were ideologies, which I think some people did hold almost religious fervor about. But look, count up all the Nazis that were at the height of the German Empire in 1943, and you don't get anywhere close to 1.6 billion people. And ditto for communists, because, I, I, you know, I, not everybody in the Soviet Union was communist. <laughs> um, and certainly in China, they don't seem to be anymore. So, so um, Islam is the world's second largest religion behind Christianity. So, therefore, you can sort of understand where some people are like, well, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't, uh, you know, just unilaterally criticize uh, the world's second largest religion. But uh, as I often point out with people to people, there is a difference between saying what Islam teaches mm -hmm. and what is clearly in the Quran and the Hadiths and Islamic history uh, uh, and that sort of thing and saying that all Muslims believe that. Mm -hmm. You know, and Boris alluded to this earlier, there's a lot more to Islam than jihad. And this goes back again to pull in what you said earlier about being an Islamophobe. And, and, and my wife, I always grouse to my wife about people calling me that. My wife like would just shake her head and go, why don't you just tell them you wouldn't have spent 20 some years of your life studying this? <laughs> yes, right. I hated it so bad, which right. is basically what you said, Pete. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My wife sometimes just needs to hit me in the head with something. It's, it, it's useful. Um, but yeah, exactly. Pete, I mean, I started, for everybody. Islam, I actually started as an undergrad before I'd even graduated. I knew it, I went to a book sale at our college library and Kenneth Craig's book, the call of the minaret. Do you know that book for us? Uh, no, no. Kenneth Craig was the former Anglican Archbishop of Jerusalem, and the book came out in like I don't know 1958 or something, and it is still one of the best books ever written on Islam. But so I started studying Islam even before I went in the army. In the army, it, when I wanted to learn Russian, and the army made me learn Arabic. 
So yeah, Islamophobia is just, you don't spend your years studying something like this if you hate it. It's just ridiculous. I have a great deal of respect for Islamic civilization, uh, for a lot of Muslims in general. And, and, and the fact that, you know, a small percentage of them engage in jihad and terrorism against the West does not negate the fact that a lot of them don't, of course. But but, but, but why do they engage in that? Because it is in the text. It is in the example of their founder. Muhammad is a lot different from Jesus. So, so in that regard, to circle back to what I started with, to follow on from what Boris said, you, the analytical lens, as well as the response to movements coming out of Islam, have to be different than they were when you're dealing with Nazis and with communists, because mm -hmm. it's a religion and it's profoundly different. So, so you do have to treat it different. And, and I think a lot of people do tread, you know, it makes them nervous. You're criticizing a religion. I'm like, I don't know. Those same people don't seem to have a problem with criticizing evangelical Christians, for instance. But, but you know, let me add to here, it, for the sake of complete honesty, I mean, look, I'm a Christian. I, I happen to think Islam is not I, – I don't believe the prophetic claims of Muhammad. I, this is why I refuse to call him the prophet. And I get annoyed when books that are supposed to be books and writers and speakers that are supposed to be subject, excuse me, objective, refer to Muhammad as the prophet with a capital P. Well, he's a prophet if you're a Muslim. I mean, I don't read, I, I, you know, history books refer to him as the prophet with capital P. They won't, don't refer to Jesus as the son of God, capital S, capital G. <laughs> well, if we're going to be symmetrical, we should. But that's just a bit of carping there. But 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 there's a point behind it. And as a Christian. You know, I, I do, again, I do not I do not accept the truth claims of Islam. I nonetheless greatly respect Islam as a civilization. As I said, I greatly respect many Muslims for the fact that they live their faith better, or at least they act. You know, I should say better. They, they live their faith more faithfully, if I could say that, than a lot yeah. of Christians. And I, and I do respect a lot of things from Islamic civilization. So so I, I'm not one of these people that thinks that because Islam is. I, because as a Christian, I don't accept the truth claims that there's no good in Islam, because I certainly think that. I mean, C.S. Lewis once famously said, I could not believe Christianity if I thought it was 100 percent true and every other religion was 100 percent false. There's truth in other religions. So 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 or at least good, I guess you could say. Uh, but what I try to do and and Boris, tell me where you are on with this, if you don't mind, maybe something to talk about. Is, is, is I try to disassociate, however, when I do my analysis. Like when I was working for five years at Special Operations Command in the J-2, I didn't write reports saying, eh, Muhammad's a false prophet and you all ought to be going to church. No, I didn't say that. I basically looked at what ISIS said in Davik magazine, for instance, about eschatology and what they wanted to do and why they wanted to rule Syria and what they were trying to spark the U.S. to do. And or, you know, the Westerners, the Crusaders. And, and then I, and then that was my analysis, but it wasn't my view. Of, my, my view is a Christian of Islam. It was my reading the Islamic texts and what they said, and then taking it to face value and saying, this is what we got to take seriously. Yes, yeah, Steve, you're completely, I, I, I mean, I really fully agree with you. Uh, first, what you mentioned earlier about the theory and the majority of people, of course, they do not follow many of them. They do not even know what the theory is right. of their own religion. Uh, we should maybe add to this that Muslims are the greatest victims of radical Islam because most victims of jihadism are Muslims. Yes. Uh, but we do not know these numbers so very much because we don't count them as careful as we count Western, European or American uh, victims. Now, when it comes to uh, 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 comparison with Christianity, and I'm also a Christian and I do believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Now, uh, and when I read the New Testament, and for example, uh, on one page, Jesus says, if somebody hits you on one cheek, turn to him the other. Mm -hmm. Well, we, most of us Christians know that it's written in the Bible. Now, how many Christians do you know that actually do that? <laughs> well, quite a few, right? Not, not, not many, anyway. And, and that's the same thing is with, uh, with Islam. Uh, uh, first of all, quite few Muslims, especially those who are European Muslims like ours, know at all what's written in, in Quranic and other uh, early texts. Mm -hmm. But once they find out even how many of them would follow that, very, very few. Mm -hmm. So so there are these similarities between religions, which I think we should 
recognize and we can use our own experience in uh, if we are uh, religious uh, in uh, to apply in, in in studying and researching other religions. Of course, we should not include in our scholarly researches any religious aspects because that that wouldn't be scholarship. That's 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 a religion. I completely agree with that, and that's why. Uh, so I definitely never claim that Jesus is the Son of God. One, uh, I mean, about Trinity, for example, because that's that's a matter of belief. Now, just uh, 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 let's take another example on that on that line. When modern scholars and even general public, but let's keep it, keep it to the scholars, the, the academic community, when they say Christians, Jews, and Muslims worship the same god no they do not hmm. but that is an islamic statement yes. of faith it says in the quran it says that your god and our god is one and the same god now i have full respect uh, for a muslim that believes that and that's his belief my belief as christian is that i worship god of israel and god who is Father of Jesus Christ, Allah is not that God. So, uh, uh, so we have somehow allowed a, a statement of faith, a purely doctrinal uh, position from Islam to enter our civilization and even our Christian faith. So, for example, you have this uh, Croatian teacher at Yale called Miroslav Wolf, who is otherwise he's a great Christian. He's a great a uh, scholar, but he wrote that book, Allah, a Christian perspective, which is which is a major, I'm sorry to say BS from an academic position, because he, she just out, out, outright uh, claims that, of course, it is the same God, and then he explains uh, why is it so. But on the other hand, that's why he's holding position at Yale, and you, Tim, uh, are not. Uh, so right. we are now, you know, uh, we, 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 th there are many things which are confu confused and confusing in this um, in this um, uh, discussion. Well, Religion, yeah, of course, let, let me say real yes. quick on that too. That, that thing that Christians, Muslims, and Jews worship the same God, you will find it in world history, college world history texts. You will find it What's in the high school history texts. And again, this is not some sort of, uh, you know, obscure point, Pete. This mm. is important because, as, as as he just said, and as Boris just said, in fact, I'm pulling one of my history textbooks out here to find it. I'm looking for it. This basically means that that that, that faith claims about Islam are are put into the Western educational system as fact, when when as a matter of fact they aren't. So, or or I should say that it's it's let's certainly something upon which many Christians would disagree. But yet people, in the same way that you'll see the prophet, capital P, put in textbooks, people will then people will then be given the Islamic perspective on something as if it were true and as if it, there were any debate about it in the hist it, 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 among historians, and there certainly is. So this goes back to that whole thing that sort of undergirds most of what we're talking about today, which is that there's just a, a, a lot of vast ignorance, many of intentional, much of it intentional in the West about about Islam. But then look, if you approach Islam assuming that it is the same God, then you assume that there is also a similar uh, position towards ethic and uh, moral issues. Right. And then, of course, when somebody blows himself up to kill some other people or calls for jihad and, and beheading uh, infidels and so on, you, uh -huh. you by default, you assume that that's a deviation within that religion because your position that you start from is that these three are somehow very similar. So, so, so I don't know. Maybe, maybe the first to 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 uh, to, to distangle all, all these stories perhaps should be Christian theologians. And again, I'm not speaking about uh, polemics about. Islamic dogmas. Of course, I do not believe that Muhammad was a prophet or something, but I'm talking about Christian apologetics that will defend Christian faith from intrusions 
from the uh, from an alien culture, uh, religion, and worldview. Oh gosh, Boris, that's a whole other can of worms, isn't it, Pete? <laughs> I mean, and no offense, but you know, uh, we're going to have to we would have to uh, dissect uh, many things that Pope Francis has said. So, oh yeah. Uh, Boy, I wish you guys had kept Pope Benedict in power, but uh, it didn't work out, did it? Amen um, to that. You know, <laughs> let, let me but, let me ask you this too, because you know we've gotten pretty heady. I want to pull it back a little bit and just Boris and I had a conversation that isn't possible in the common day to day life for at least most U.S. citizens. I can't speak for the rest of the world, but I will speak for most of us. And he basically said, "Don't you guys study, you know, the Orient?" Aren't, don't you guys study Orientalism? And I'm like, oh, ixnate on the Oriental say. You can't, you know, we can't throw that word around. That's how terrified we are of using the proper words for something. That just, Tim, I mean, do you commonly, and, and maybe you do, but do you commonly say the word Oriental or Orientalism? Or is it just not worth the hassle that you would get I, for saying I, that? I, only to make fun of Edward Said. That's the only time I introduced that into the conversation. Then you have to explain it like I did earlier. Yeah, most people don't know. I, I tend to just talk about area studies, Pete, uh -huh. which is, again, as I said earlier, you know, you, you can't be an expert on Russia. And I would argue, I, again, but that I'm, I'm firmly a, a, a Lewisian, I guess you could say, a Lewisian Orientalist. If you're going to be an expert on Russia, you need, need to be able to read, you know, uh, St. Theophan the Recluse in Russian, for God's sake. Uh, <laughs> You need to be able to, if you're going to be an expert on China, you need to be able to read Sun Tzu and 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 uh, and, and for that matter Mao in Chinese. Or, right. So so the same applies to the Middle East. Um, now you, that's not to say you can't get at a very good knowledge of it with secondary sources. Certainly you can. I mean there are a lot of people that have done that. Um, but to be truly respected in the field, and it, I guess maybe unfortunately, but that's the case, right, Horace? You really kind of have to know one of the major languages, at least. For many of us, again, mm -hmm. this doesn't apply in English departments because Saeed has convinced them all that they can be experts on anything just by reading, you know, secondary sources in English. But, um, but no, yeah, I don't I, talk I, about I agree with you. I just tend to I, talk I, about area studies because, again, you have to unpack that Orientalism thing for people. Yeah. It's, uh, you, like you said, it's a lot of trouble. Boris? Well, you've gone too far. You've gone too far when it comes to political correctness, it seems to me, because in Croatia, that's not an issue. I teach a course, uh, undergraduate course at the, at the University of Zagreb, uh, which I teach in English because we have students from other countries, and it's called Oriental Jews and Arabs in Time of Zionism. And I've never had a complaint about the, the, the title, and, I, and I, you know, I consider myself an Orientalist. Uh, that's what I say. So that that's really not not an issue here. We are not so um, we we have have had other troubles in in our country. Uh, we, we have have to be political correct when it comes to other stuff. For example, we can't criticize uh, European Union. Let's say we we all have to be against Brexit. For example, uh, so so this is not an issue. But perhaps because there is no so much knowledge about what what's politically correct. But then also. Croats recently were at war in Bosnia Herzegovina right. against jihadism. Right. Uh, I recently published an article in which I explained that the Sunnis and the Shia uh, in the last, uh, let's say, 50 years, whenever they got in, in a conflict uh, somewhere uh, with a third party, be it uh, Soviet Union in Afghanistan or later uh, with the U.S. Or, or now with each other in the Middle East, there are only two conflicts of modernity in which they were fighting against somebody and did not turn against each other. Number one, that's Israel. And number two, that was Croats of Bosnia Herzegovina. So, so uh, the, the the issue of relevance of Islam and studying this is uh, more recognized here because of that rather recent experience. And I should also add that uh, several hijackers from 9/11 were waging jihad in 1992 to 1994 in Bosnia Herzegovina, mainly against Croats. Hmm. So it's all very very uh, connected. Now, back to secondary sources, I, I do not think that we should expect from a general public to study uh, such a really, you know, hard and complicated language as, as, um, as uh, Arabic is. Uh, there are excellent 
uh, secondary sources, but also primary sources, have been translated into English. You have, I mentioned Ibn Ishaq's uh, uh, Sira is translated by Oxford University Press back in 1950s. Uh, 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 State of New York University has translated complete uh, history of, uh, of At-Tabari, uh, Tarikh Arusul Wal Muluk, uh, the history of prophets and kings. And it's available, you can buy it on Amazon, it's in, in 40 volumes, four zero <clears throat> volumes. And it's, it's a great read for a scholar who do not have any clue about uh, uh, language. And then they can slowly start to learn language, but also general public should take some of these books and read because, I mean, you do not, not have to know Hebrew and Greek to start to read your Bible as a civilizational text. You don't have to be believer. You don't have to share that worldview, but you want to know something about uh, uh, Judeo-Christian faith. Take the Bible in your native language. Uh, the same is with Islam. Take those primary sources. Now, why do I say primary sources in English? Because it's very hard to find good secondary sources. Uh, who is promoted in the U.S., for example? You have that, that dude called John Esposito. And uh, I, would, I would warmly uh, suggest not to read those books because right. they are really heavily misleading. Right. Uh, take, as you mentioned, Bernard Lewis. Uh, but, but on the other hand, Bernard Lewis, he's not a theologian. He's a, and he's a very, very cautious. He's a, that's, a, that's a heavy scholarship. He's great. Um, uh, uh, there are uh, right. there, there are secondary sources uh, available. Um, thinking about uh, uh, some of it. I know the author, but he published under a different name, so I, I, sh I should not mention him now on, on, on the air, uh, who wrote a, a great book about Islam. Uh, th there are available, you, you mentioned an author uh, in the beginning of, of this show, uh, so uh, I think sh people should like net up, or how would you say, and, and share the information right. about good books which are not anti-Islamic. I also do not like, that. Th there are some authors who, who really write books which are heavily biased against Islam. I mean, it's almost on the verge of hate speech, which, which we all, as, 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 as scholars and as Christians, uh, we do not want to spread hate towards anybody. We want people to know a theory. And if that theory presents a security threat, that's that's, that's a great reason to study that theory, but still keeping respect to people who adhere to that civilization or religion and to love them. Yeah, Boris, Pete, let me add real quick. Please. Um, yeah, Boris, uh, thanks for that clarification. What I was talking about earlier was more on the, along the lines of sort of a covert critique of, um, of scholars, of the idea that came from Saeed that you don't have to, you can be an expert in Islam without knowing Arabic or Ottoman, Turkish or Persian. You know, on the academic level, I think that's problematic. But on the popular level, you're exactly right. And let me add to books. Uh, the author that I mentioned earlier was Kenneth Craig, who was, again, the, the former Anglican Archbishop of, um, of, of Jerusalem. And besides writing The Call of the Minaret, he w wrote two other wonderful books. One was called um, Jesus. That's what was it called? Um, let's see. Uh, Muhammad and the Christian and Jesus and the Muslim. And basically, in each of those, he kind of takes the perspective of each religion and looks at the other religion. He and, and he and by the way, he he's very firm Anglican, old school Anglican, not like the modern Anglican Episcopal Church, which has sort of lost its mind, but Orthodox Christian with a small O and a look. But it's a very faithful look at the truth claims of, uh, uh, of Islam from a Christian perspective and vice versa. And it's very fair without sacrificing clearly his 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 Christian perspective so yeah but but there are many Boris, i totally agree with you there are many good books in you know english french european languages particularly in english however about islam and and and, and, and people yeah people should go out there and read it the problem is again many of them will read esposito and and other people that that just have an agenda that that really don't present the truth there's definitely a few tests along the way when I encounter folks who want to talk about Islam at any level. And I am I am no Islamic expert at all. I just have a lot of practical time dealing with, with folks in the Islamic world. 
But like, if you don't have a command of who, or at least an awareness that Al Ghazili exists, you know, like I, I don't have time for that conversation because um, y- you've got work to do, you know. And and this is, I'm saying this as a guy that's not been cover to cover through the Quran, but use I use the culture of Islam to my advantage. But I, I know that I'm ignorant, and I, I ask the questions that an ignorant person asks who's curious. Fellas, what does someone do? I mean, like, they don't need a PhD in this thing, especially, gosh, I hope we're talking to folks that work in foreign policy, international relations, international security, so that they can understand the power of religion in a society. I mean, these things are, you know, when when I presented the paper, what got Boris's attention was I was able to talk somewhat intelligently about, you know, Salman Pak, Salman the Farsi, you know, who was Muhammad's barber and how important that was regionally for these people because his shrine was in the area that I was at. So help me, help me understand, like, like, what's the just the basics? Like, how do we get to the point where we can at least understand the impact of religion in an area? I think that the first thing that we should do is to, you know, remember how how the West was generally, let's say, civilized. That's the scholars were always at the forefront of 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 bringing knowledge and enlightenment and and out of it came all the good things that we have in this greater greatest civilization that that ever was created on the face of the earth which is judeo-christian western civilization Uh, so what i basically do is this i say to scholars do not do not get into polemics over islam prophets same God, not same God, focus on one word which makes academic and non-academic knowledge different. That is the method. When we bring back the word method into academia and focus on right methodology before anything else, including right ideology, then we will win this battle. But we have to bring back that sacred word of academia methodology and it has to apply in studying of anything from medicine and rocket science to political science history and oriental studies i think it's quite simple i mean we should just you know define it and go for it tim i would add to that pete pete that as someone who teaches a lot of surveys in Western uh, Civ and world and, and world history, particularly the early world history class. When I deal with, uh, you know, uh, ancient Near Eastern civilization and Greece and Rome and and, and that and, and, and those areas, that Americans, for the most part, I mean, I, this, it sounds like things are better in Croatia, Boris. But Americans, I mean, it sounds based on some of what you said that you have a higher, perhaps, level of undergraduate student than, than I'm used to, unfortunately. Uh, many Americans don't know much about their own uh, culture and civilization. Uh, they, are, they are taught, I'll give you an example, in American history, my wife talked about this. My wife was a history major undergraduate then went to law school. And she said, for instance, like in law school, she said, the only thing pretty much that we learn of American constitutional law and law school was uh, civil rights. That was it. We didn't know anything else about the Constitution. And, and, and I, that's a bit of a slight exaggeration, but I don't think it's a, I think it's only a slight exaggeration. So because, I mean, civil rights are very important. And, and, and on the undergraduate level, I know this from a fact. I, I, I ask students this every term. What do you learn about American history in high school? Slavery. They learn about slavery. Okay, now they probably should learn about slavery and the fact that we fought this four year civil war that was the bloodiest war in American history to get rid of slavery. They should learn that, but that shouldn't be the only thing they learn. But that for many of them, particularly in public school here in Georgia, that, that, that's that's mainly what they learn about American history. They don't learn about anything else. Um, they don't learn the importance of Christianity and the development of Western civilization. They don't. And, and, and they're also told. They're also told in public education in America that religion isn't really a topic that you should study because, A, it's not important, uh, B, it rubs people the wrong way, or C, all of the above. And so, therefore, when, you, when, when we're talking something, the topic we're discussing here today, that in order to understand the threat posed by a violent minority of the world's Muslims – which, by the way, I should add, is not just a violent minority world of Muslims, because there are a number of Muslims, a larger number, who are 
certainly not violent, but who wish to change the political system of the West. I mean, we see that clearly happening, yeah. which I actually think is a greater long-term threat than terrorism. When, when that is adduced as a topic that you need to know something about, people's eyes just glaze over because they've been told their whole life that you shouldn't study things like that. You know, religion in America, if you're a Christian, which the majority still identify as, is something you do on Sunday morning, and you're supposed to keep it out of the public sphere. And, and so, A, they aren't conversant with the whole idea, as Boris was talking about earlier, apologetics. Apologetics can be to being able to defend what you believe against those that don't believe the same. And B, they are taught you aren't supposed to say anything critical about certainly another religion because that's not being nice and not being a nice of course is the main top main main goal of the christians to, is to be nice <laughs> the more they get that idea but it's often inculcated so so all of those things make it very difficult to to you know for for, for the body politic particularly in this country to look at this issue honestly and, and, and you know i, I would add a, a little late to the game here with this one, but earlier when Boris was talking about this belief that, um, that, that is presented basically as something everybody agrees on, that Jews, Christians, and Muslims worship the same God, I would add also that basically most Americans have the idea that all religions basically are like Christianity or Buddhism, which is that, you know, they're, they teach violence and, 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 and turn the other cheek and, and, and that sort of thing. And when you try to tell them that, well, that's not exactly what Islam teaches, uh, people just either, again, their eyes glaze over and they start drooling or they reject out of hand what you say because it doesn't accord with what they've been taught. And then when you get people that have gone through those systems and then, you you know, God forbid, God knows what they teach at Ivy Leagues on these topics. And then those people get in the State Department and get in policymaking positions in three-letter agencies and, and administrations. Then you see where we wind up where we are. Yeah. 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 Well, to know about Islam is also uh, it's a it's a partly it's a part of general education. And if somebody doesn't want to to learn, I mean, we can't do nothing about it. Right. Right. Uh, but but for those people who do want, uh, I believe that, that we scholars have this great tool invoking method. And by invoking method, we open up for everything else, including those things which are politically incorrect, we can criticize Edward Said. I mean, his, his pamphlet is, is, is very shallow. I mean, he's accusing right. German Orientalists of working for imperialists when there was no German colony, you know, imperialism in the Middle East. So it's easy to refute those, uh, those claims, uh, again, based on, uh, but, but invoking the word, the sacred, I would say, for academia word method. But the other thing that you also... Uh, mentioned is the the issue of identity. Now, if somebody is not aware and is, is not proud of his own heritage, uh, for example, the the Christian heritage, uh, the great uh, American identity, which which you know I appreciate and admire very much, your your country, and we are indebted to a degree to you both for the breakdown of the communism, but also for for uh, winning our war. You did. Uh, at least politically support Croatia. We will never forget it, and we will always be thankful for this. Uh, now, uh, uh, now, if young people do not cherish their identity, of course, that's a big problem uh, because uh, Muslims from the Middle East have very strong identity, and they are they are, they are confident that what they do, uh, uh, not only violent jihad, but also pursuit of changing our Western uh, society, as you said correctly, that's that's a, that's an immense threat. Not at all, not being recognized yet. It's very hard to to stand up against uh, that threat. I mean, just look, uh, uh, Western Europeans, especially up in the north, not only are they not sure about their national or religious identity, they are not sure about their bloody gender. I mean, they don't know if they are boys or girls. You know, and now comes somebody from the Middle East, you know, who, who is, who, you know, completely confident in, in, in the path of Allah. I mean, these, these dudes stand no chance in confronting him. In, and I'm not talking about violent confrontation. I'm talking about identity confrontation. So definitely 
we need to get back identities that we have lost somewhere on the way. And, and, and I mean, from that matter, it's, it's really, it's not irrelevant to remember again that the same fi uh, sources of finance for financing these uh, uh, identity losses, and I'm, I'm, I'm referring to Soros again, is the, the, the same purse that financed publishing of Edward Said's Orientalism mm -hmm. into a European language. There is a strategy on that uh, far left, liberal left, which I believe uh, uh, um, uh, 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 scholars, especially conservative scholars, should recognize and see how to engage in defending our civilization. But when it comes to politics, I think President Trump is doing great job in helping in, in, the, in, the, in the arena of politics. Well, that's a good spot to stop right there. Leave everybody with the taste of Trump in their mouth. And I'm, sure, I'm sure they'll all enjoy that. Hey, Boris, obviously we're going to have to do another one of these because what you and Tim just did for all of us out here who are interested in trying to get international things right and understand religion, gosh, we just need more of, of these conversations because these books are sitting on the shelf if they're allowed to be on the shelf. I mean, it shocks the shit out of me that there is a book that's a seminal book from a leading figure in the world on this topic that you can't even wrap your hands around and read. You know, when when my brothers and sisters in arms are going to go abroad and go try to answer these these problems. I mean, it's to me that it's just it's shocking that we're so willfully ignorant and and vain about what we know and what don't know. I, I, I know I know don't I know I don't know enough about Islam, um, but that's a starting point where I can say, oh my gosh, there's so much more for me to learn, and I already know quite a bit. But fellas, it's well, such Pete, a can good I make chat. a shameless plug here and say, hey folks, go to Amazon and find my books. They're pretty cheap, and they'll help you out. Yeah, that's true. Tim's Tim's got a yeah. And also listen to Tim's earlier episodes than when we talk about Islam because he provides great insight. And actually we should look back at um that one we talked about before President Trump became President Trump on what the next president should do, like what you would advise, because uh I, I don't think they followed your advice. So Well listen We've been at this for an hour, and you guys, it's the holiday, so I appreciate you taking your time. It's precious. And for sure, Boris, let's get back on. Let's do another one of these. Yes, Pete, thank you very much. for. It was my pleasure and honor to, to participate in this, and uh, I'm, I'm so glad to have met Tim. Uh, Tim, I'll definitely look up for your books on the Amazon. I'm looking forward to reading them. Um, I'm happy we, we, we met uh, virtually, at least, uh, like this. And uh, this is a topic which will not lose its relevance. So I'm sure that uh, Break It Down show will have more opportunities to, to bring this issue again. Yes, we will. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Let me say, Pete, gentlemen, it's been an honor sharing the field of ideological battle with you. I may steal a line from the replacements. <laughs>